Okay. All right, so we're gonna get started. People are kind of trickling in. Hello, everyone, and welcome. Okay. All right. So hello, everyone. Um, we are gathering here today in this digital space, but we are being hosted by the University of Michigan Dearborn. The University, the University of Michigan Dearborn sits on the territory of Three Fires Confederacy of First Nations, which is comprised of the Potowatomi, the Ojibwe, and the Odawa. So with this, we begin our program with the humble beginnings of an acknowledgement that hopes to honor the indigenous people of the land on which the university currently resides. Um, we do this to acknowledge, to honor, and also to uplift the first people who sorted these lands in the past and their descendants who continue to carry on their legacy in the present. To members of the indigenous community, please know that you are not forgotten. So hello everyone, and thank you for choosing to join us today um, as we continue to celebrate the life and legacy of Dr. Um, Martin Luther King Jr. My name is Gerard, uh, my pronouns are he and him, um, and my title is the race, ethnicity, intercultural, and Intersectional Identities Program Manager uh, at the Center for Social Justice and Inclusion here at U of M Dearborn. Um, and I'm so excited that we were able to host Dr. Loretta J. Ross um, as she lectures on calling in the call-out culture. Um, I first saw Dr. Ross um, when she lectured at U of M um, Ann Arbor and at the Rackham Graduate School. Um, and she, she did the exact same lecture and I was in the audience um, and I believe you were, Dr. Ross, you were offering, you were doing anti-racism classes and you're yeah. offering them for $5. <laughs> you kept being $5, like, $5. $5 online classes. <laughs> yes. And I, I was like, do. I like her. <laughs> I, I still do. You was like, you said, uh, it's the price of a chicken sandwich. I was like, it sure is. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, we got to get her. And so, so now we have you here and I'm so excited. Um, but before we introduce, uh, Dr. Ross and give her her time. I just wanted to cover a few housekeeping items. Um, so first, the Q&A feature is active. So definitely feel free to ask questions there. Um, there'll be space um, after Dr. Ross presents to ask those questions or we'll, we'll kind of filter through the questions at that point. Um, the closed captioning feature is active or it should be. Um, if it's not, just let me know and I will turn it on. Um, and then also this session is being recorded um, and it will be posted to the, the university's YouTube account uh, for viewing later. Um, and then if you're having any technical issues, uh, just let us know in the chat and I will try. It'll be me, so I'm, I'm gonna try. I can't promise, but I will try to uh, help you out. Um, and so with that, I will pass it on to, oh, and first I should thank uh, some of our partners, uh, U of M Flint, and the Women and Gender Studies here at U of M Dearborn for helping to co-sponsor us to host Dr. Ross today. So thank you all for your support. Um, and then I'm gonna pass it on to Q to, in, to introduce Dr. Ross. Thank you. Hi, I'm Q. I'm the program manager for the ICC and I am going to read just a little bit of the bio because I think um, her talk will speak for the work that she, um, she does. So, and I use she, her pronouns. So Loretta was the national coordinator of the Sister Strong, Sister Song, excuse me, Woman of Color Reproductive Justice Collective from 2005 to 2012 and co-created the theory of reproductive justice. Loretta was the national co-director of the April 25th, 2014 March of Women's Lives in Washington, DC, the largest protest in March in US history at that time. She founded the National Center for Human Rights Education, also known as NCHRE in Atlanta, Georgia, launched a women of color program for the National Organization of Women, also known as now NOW, and was the national program program director of the National Black Women's Health Project, one of the first African-American women to direct a rape crisis center. Loretta was the third executive director of the DC Rape Can uh, Crisis Center. Loretta is a mother, grandmother, and great grandmother. One thing left on her bucket list is to see Venus and Serena play tennis live. She is an avid pinnacle player competing in tournaments across the country because this is now how she balances her activist life with apolitical hobbies. And welcome, Dr. Ross. Oh, thank you for that wonderful reading of the bio. As you could tell, I'm all over the place because I have <laughs> the classic old slutty crone who 
as spending the rest of my life, what's left of it, teaching what I've learned over 50 years of social justice and human rights activism. And I wanna say in honor of Dr. King, I wanna give y'all some perspective that I've learned over time. And that is the inevitability of the victory for justice and human rights. A lot of people get discouraged because the struggle seems so long, so protracted. We're up against opponents who seem to have all the money, who seem to have all the power, who seem to even have all the media attention. But I want to remind us that there is an inevitability about the struggle for human rights and justice. And the inevitability is not really about how well we conduct the struggle or how right we are or how passionate we are. The inevitability is born of the fact of who our opponents are fighting. Those people who are opposed to us teaching things like critical race theory or dealing with anti-Semitism or Islamophobia or hatred of immigrants or misogyny or white supremacy or ableism, transphobia, homophobia, those people are not the ones who are going to win because their opponents are not us their opponents are even bigger than us because their opponents are time that they cannot reverse, truth that they cannot hide, history that they cannot deny, and evidence that they cannot bury. And I think that any one of those things would be sufficient to defeat them because there's been no way in humanity's history that people have been able to reverse time, deny history successfully and permanently, uh, bury the evidence and keep the truth from coming out. And so I take a lot of solace and a lot of hope from the fact that we're going to struggle for human rights as best we can. But our biggest problem may be not to, de not to snatch defeat from the jaws of victory because we have so much working for us. We have time, evidence, truth, and history working on our side. And if we just don't get in our way, I think that there's an inevitability about our victory over injustice, over hypocrisy, over people trying to deconstruct our democracy so that they can set up a, an apartheid-like system and permanently run it. So I'm going to talk today about calling in the calling out culture, because that's what I've been concerned with over the last six or seven years, because I'm more concerned now about how we do our work as I am about the issues that we work on. And so I have a PowerPoint that I'm going to share with you and walk through it rather quickly. And then hopefully you'll line up your questions at the end of my presentation so that we can have a lively discussion about how to transform the calling out culture into a calling in culture. But first, let me see if I've mastered this thing enough to share my screen. Can you see that? Yes, we can. Okay, okay say so somebody speak up because I can't make the assumption that- We, it's we can see. Great, great, great. And now I should be able to hide my hosting meeting controls so that I can get out of my own way. Okay, then. Um, I began thinking about the calling out culture when I got on social media and found out how unbelievably mean people are to each other. And this is not something that I've failed to notice in the past, but there's a virality about it in, over social media, where before, if you wanted to talk badly about somebody, you had to do it in real life. You actually had to get on the phone or summon your friends to gossip about them. And that was a limit to your outreach. But now you can summon 10,000 people to mob somebody with a tweet, with a Facebook post, with an Instagram photo. 
And so I am concerned because we are choosing, choosing to do our social justice activism in such a way that it's likely to be non-productive. Now I should say, why am I doing this work? I am a member of the human rights movement. And it's important to remember that Dr. King in his last Sunday sermon, March 31st, 1968, four days before he was assassinated, called on us to build a human rights movement and join the freedom explosion taking place around the world. And I know when I first heard about Dr. King's speech from March 31st, 1968, I was outraged because everyone told me Dr. King had a dream. No one told me he had a plan that we were supposed to be building a US-based human rights movement so that we could stop human rights violations domestically and those human rights violations that are done in our name internationally. I was really disappointed that we don't teach more of how radical Dr. King's dream was rather than the passive, you know, co-optation of his message that takes place. But nevertheless, I am a feminist, so I'm part of the women's rights wing of the human rights movement. But because I also care about racial justice, I'm part of the civil rights wing of our human rights movement. I'm disabled, so I care about disability rights and human rights. I also care about transphobia and homophobia and all the other forms of bigotry and anti-Semitism and Islamophobia. So I care about being part of the anti-bigotry wing of the human rights movement. Obviously, I don't have enough space to put enough arrows on this page, but I'm saying we need to reconceptualize ourselves as being part of a unified human rights movement that focuses on different things based on our own lived experiences and knowledges, but understand that we can't do our work for human rights in a way that violates people's human rights without undermining the entire framework. <clears throat> so I can't do work to fight for civil rights in a way that's misogynist. I can't do work to fight transphobia in a way that's misogynist. I can't do work for women's rights in a way that's racist. And I can't do work for indigenous rights in a way that's xenophobic on and on and on, because how we do the work is as important as the work we do. So once we reconceptualize ourselves as being part of the same movement, then we recognize that a movement is comprised of many different people thinking many different thoughts but moving in the same direction. But when many different people think the same thought and they move in the same direction, that's a cult. And we're not building the human rights cult, we're building a human rights movement. And in order to build this movement, we're going to have to change how we deal with and relate to each other. So I've created something called the C5 continuum. Uh, most of us are familiar with the concept of calling each other out, which of course is publicly shaming people for things that you think they've done wrong that you think they should be held accountable for. That's our default in many instances where we think that's what we're supposed to do to do social justice and human rights work. And there's no surprise that we think that's the way to go because that's what the human rights movement has done is to call out governments, call out individuals, call out corporations who have violated people's human rights. The ultimate call out is to demand that people be canceled, that they lose a job or they lose their platform or they lose some other marker of who they are and how they're employed because you think they've done something that's unforgettable and unforgivable. And so we see a lot of demands for the cancellation of people, but I do need to say that in American society within academia, most people who are canceled within our college campuses and universities are leftist 
professors rather than right as professors, even though the right wing is busily trying to claim that they're the ones being criticized and canceled for being too, uh, too, too heterodox, I guess, in, in many ways, and are too orthodox. When in fact, you know, they are they 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 are uh, in many ways supporting the status quo of oppression and aiming most of the efforts for cancellation towards people who don't go along with the status quo, like calling for the cancellation of teaching around critical race theory or racial justice or gender justice or an appropriate the truth about American history, et cetera, et cetera. Now, along the continuum, uh, a young trans man named Lone Tran created the concept of calling in in 2013. And in calling in, they talked about how we should pivot. Instead of calling people out, we should actually use love and respect as ways to call people in. And you're still pursuing accountability, but instead of using anger, blaming, and shaming as your method of choice, you're choosing to use love and respect. And you understand that you're calling people in not because of who they are, but because of who you are. And you're making a choice to walk through the world leading with your grace, with your humility, and with your ability to respect other people's humanity whether or not you, you know, they deserve it or not, their deserving of it doesn't uh, determine whether or not you choose to offer it. There is an intermediate step called Calling On. Now, Calling On was created by a woman named Sonia Renee Taylor, who wrote the book, The Body is Not an Apology. And Sonia posits that if you're calling people in or you're calling them out, you're committing to making an investment in that person with your time and your attention. And sometimes you're just not in a space where you want to give somebody your time or attention. So she defines calling on as requesting or requiring that people do better without your investing any time. For example, my favorite calling on sentence is to simply look at the person who said something that I don't necessarily agree with, just look at them and just say, I beg your pardon. And I look them in the eye and I just wait. While they figure out whether or not they wanna double down on what they said or walk it back. In this instance, I've neither called them in or out. I've just called on them to do better if they're gonna talk to me. And of course, the fifth aspect of the C5 continuum is called calling it off. We don't do that enough. We don't have an obligation to engage in non-productive conversations with people uh, who aren't talking to us in good faith or trying to use their own alternative facts or, or who are basically insulting you or insulting your intelligence. You have no obligation to do that. So whether it's in person or online, you can call it off permanently. Like, I don't have the bandwidth to ever have this conversation with you again in life. Or you could call it off temporarily and say, I'm not in a space to have this conversation now, but can we get together later and continue the conversation? So all of these things have definitions attached to them. As I said, calling out is publicly demanding that others change their behavior, speech, or thought. Calling in is when you actually develop the public or private skills for having these difficult conversations, but you're always going to work to respect their human rights and their right to be different from you. And calling on, requesting that people do better, or canceling them, demanding that people lose their jobs or their platforms or their lives sometimes for things you think they've done wrong. Privilege are those advantages that we're not responsible to or accountable for, but we have, and we need to be uh, aware of our privileges. There's things like white privilege or age privilege or gender privilege or ability privilege or citizenship privilege. And all of these are advantages that we're not 
responsible for conferring upon ourselves, but as holders of these privileges, we need to use them responsibly. But instead, what we mostly do is weaponize our privilege, where we use our knowledge or our identity or our status to overwhelm or dominate others as if that is our right to humiliate people for not sharing our identity or our knowledge or what have you. And generally, we learn these patterns as young people where we learn that if you know something and someone else doesn't know it, then you weaponize your knowledge against them, seeking to not only overwhelm them and look good in relationship to them, but sometimes to humiliate and to embarrass them by their lack of knowledge. But what that does is fail to acknowledge that we are all victimized violators. We are all capable of having our human rights violated even at the same time we violate someone else's. So as I said, a victim of racism can still be homophobic. A victim of transphobia can still be misogynist. Just having one identity doesn't excuse you from weaponizing other things to your advantage, to the disadvantage of someone else. And the easiest example I can describe would be like a battered wife who beats her child. And then a lot of us think being woke is a competition. And so we get into what's called performance activism, where we use symbolic actions that really seek to improve our status, to show people how woke we are, uh, to get more approval from people, sometimes even strangers over the internet, because we're not apparently getting enough approval from people in our lives in real life and stuff. But the bottom line to believing that you're in a woke competition from a seasoned activist like me is that to the extent that you, you think you're in a woke competition, all you're proving is how unwoke you really are. Because this work is not a horse race. You're not trying to win at all costs. We're trying to build a movement to eliminate all forms of oppression. So when you weaponize your, act, your, your knowledge and you use it to bully or oppress other people, you're contributing to the problem rather than solving it. There also is a directionality to the call out culture. Uh, the human rights movement, as I said, is very accustomed to punching up where we hold people who have power or privilege or social or economic power uh, accountable. And quite often they're unreachable by other means or previous attempts to, to ask them to change or do something differently have fallen on deaf ears. So that's what the human rights movement does. We're famous for writing reports or calling out corporations, politicians, individuals for their human rights violations because of their ability to cause harm to so many people at the same time. Many of us, unfortunately, don't only punch up, so we also punch down. And that's when we take advantage of our own power, our own privilege, our own identities or status or knowledge to cause harm to people who can't hold us accountable. Uh, the same way that I find that it's very interesting that uh, people who immigrated a while ago are now being punching down on new immigrants trying to come into the country or someone who suffers from uh, bigotry in one instance, then punching down on um, people who suffer from bigotry in another instance. And we should not, of course, abuse our privileges that way, but it seems to be pretty common to do so. But the calling in culture is really built for those of us who punch sideways, where we spend a lot of time taking pot shots at those who are relatively at the same power status that we are even though there's differences of race, class, gender, et cetera, where we are so busily criticizing other people's social justice practices that we forget to sometimes being critical of our own. And so call, some of the symptoms of calling out is basically people always tell on themselves because they size people up 
to determine a threat to themselves before they call them out. You very seldom find people calling out somebody who could come back and retaliate against them. Uh, so it's kind of like, I want to see if it's safe before I call you out kind of approach. And as I said, people sometimes seek approval from others to demonstrate how woke they are. And a lot of times it's used as a deflection that I don't want to talk about white supremacy, so I'm going to call you out about getting my gender pronoun wrong kind of thing, where we don't want to deal with issues, and so we deflect or we will pivot to where we talk about things that are safe for us to talk about as opposed to those things that make us feel uncomfortable. And a lot of the call out culture is driven by people who are always in fight mode. They are perpetually looking for a fight, even if as they have evidence that their willingness to always cause conflict is damaging the human rights movement and silencing others. But they think it's the right thing to do because they mistakenly think that the way you do social justice work is to constantly cause conflict with others as, a, as if that friction is going to produce victory. And that's that win at all costs kind of attitude that also ends up dehumanizing the very people that we need to work with simply because they don't agree with us 100% along the way. And I often find also in many of our settings, but particularly our colleges and universities where there's this assumption that first of all, we are entitled to always feel safe and comfortable and protected. And then we get angry at anybody who doesn't make us feel safe, comfortable or protected. And that could even be such a misdirection of our anger. For example, on my campus, Smith College, a few years ago, uh, some swastikas were painted on some college a building. And apparently, whoever painted these swastikas on the building had access to the buildings that only an insider to our campus would have, because you needed a pass card or a key to get to these buildings. And But the students erupted in outrage at the president of the college because they didn't like the letter that she wrote saying that this kind of anti-Semitism didn't represent the college. They were more angry at the president for not because they didn't like her letter than they were at the people who actually did the hate crime. And I had to point out to them what a poor threat assessment that is that you have sized up the president because you know they're not going to retaliate against you. So you're going to choose to call the president out because you can get away with it rather than to actively work to find out why do we have neo-Nazis who have access to these private buildings on our campus and what can we do about it kind of thing. And this is born out of a mismatch of expectations uh, and, and not really dealing with reality and Generally, when there's that disconnect between your expectations and reality, the psychologists call that cognitive dissonance. So calling out basically means that you're going to criticize other people's social justice practices. Uh, but it's also born out of the fact that a lot of people feel unheard, disrespected, or violated. And this causes them to publicly use not only their knowledge as a weapon against each other, but what they've been through because it is a truism that hurt people hurt people. But what hurt people who hurt people don't realize is that even in the process of hurting somebody else, they are hurting themselves as well. And then there's this perception that we're supposed to banish people because they are not woke enough, even though we're replicating the prison industrial complex when we do so. And of course, we use the calling out to boost our egos, sometimes our standing in our communities. And mistakenly, we seem to think that we're supposed to unite around the purest political opinions possible, uh, as if there's not supposed to be a diversity of thoughts and a diversity of approaches and stuff like that, as if we're supposed to use 
yeah, the, the, the precise right words all the time. One of my students once remarked that calling in, or I'm sorry, that calling out is the expectation that you've already grown, not the acceptance that everyone is still growing. And so when you seek that political purity of opinion and you start shaming and bullying people for not having the right political opinion, you're basically demanding that people come to you as fully developed people who somehow agree with everything you're thinking at that time, when in reality, what you think today may or may not be what you think tomorrow. But there is a reason that the whole calling in, calling out, canceling culture is being particularly criticized now. And we need to acknowledge that. Ta-Nehisi Coates points out that any sober assessment of this history must conclude that the present objections to cancel culture are not so much concerned with the weapon as the kind of people who now seek to wield it. Until recently, cancellation flowed exclusively downward from the powerful to the powerless. But now in this era of fallen gatekeepers where anyone with a Twitter handle or a Facebook account can be a publisher, banishment has been ostensibly democratized. And so basically what Ta-Nehisi Coates is saying is that the whole call out culture has constantly been going on, uh, whether it was forbidding slaves to learn how to read or, you know, the, uh, criticizing people for not being the right kind of Christian or not having the right this or the right that or the right clothes or the right food or, you know, the scarlet letter from Nathaniel Hawthorne. We've always had a call out culture, but it historically it's been from the powerful to the powerless. But the fact is of the matter now is that anybody with a keyboard can be a critic, can blow people up. And that's when people are really protesting the democratization of the call out culture, because there are appropriate uses of call outs when there are power disparities, when people hold themselves inaccessible to feedback or critique. Sometimes you have to use call outs to avoid increasing harm or to make the fact that harms aren't, aren't being experienced. Maybe finding others who experience those harms and building community with them by spreading information that this harm is taking place or identifying sometimes invisibilized or hidden harm and lifting the voices of those who have historically been silenced. And sometimes you just are so pissed off, you have to scream out your outrage. And there are occasions when public shaming works, but most of the time calling out is not the best strategy because it ends up with us dealing with power inappropriately when we try to use calling out. Most analyses, when we fight the abuses of power, we tend to oversimplistically demand that the power be shifted to those who have the lived experience of being abused. But the problem with that overly simplified solution is that the people who have previously been abused have not learned Frequently, they have not learned how to deal with power responsibly. So they end up taking advantage of the fact that now is their equal opportunity to oppress somebody else. So there's no, so we haven't dealt with the abuse of power. We've just transferred who wields it now. And this is based on a scarcity-based model where we see power as a limited com commodity in a zero sum kind of situation so that if one person, one group of people gains power, then another group of people must necessarily have lost it. And unfortunately, when you see power distributed that way, it, re it produces resentment when people feel that they're losing something that they've enjoyed all of their lives. And that's one of the reasons I think that so much DEI and justice training goes awry because it summons and arouses these resentments that we aren't addressing because we haven't dealt with the redistribution of power in a way where everyone benefits. And so the people who formerly had the power end up 
fearing of retaliation and or even more paradoxically, I see people go through a lot of elaborate schemes to deny power, like uh, having a white people step back, uh, people of color step up kind of policy as if there's a devaluing of certain voices based on their identities and an overvaluing of other voices based on identities. And again, these are inappropriate ways of dealing with power and end up in a lot of call out. But calling in and calling out, it really are about people's identities. And the identity that I think we have to confront unflinchingly is the white identity. But first I wanna say that we need to make ourselves understand that this system of white supremacy that we are trying to dismantle can't be blamed on anybody who's alive today uh, unless you are openly embracing the ideas because we didn't create this system. Uh, so we can't be blamed for it even as we share responsibility for dismantling it. Isabel Wilkerson in her book, Cast, talks about the homeowner who just purchased a rather older house, who's very proud of owning that house, but found once they bought the house that the house has a bad foundation. Now that homeowner can't be blamed for the fact that the foundation has been neglected for a number of years, but that homeowner does have the responsibility for fixing that foundation as they enjoy the privilege of owning that home. And that's where we are in the United States. Unless we are Methuselah, we were not arrived 500 years ago when this settler colonial project called the United States was erected and the system of white supremacy constructed as a way to manage our economic, social, and political relationship within it. At the same time, we do enjoy the privileges of being in this country, particularly if we have citizenship. And so we have a responsibility for fixing those things that are wrong with our democracy, even if we're not responsible for creating this system of injustice. And so it's very important to point out to people that what we are fighting is the ideology of white supremacy, not the identity of whiteness. Whiteness is a, race, a socially constructed identity, just like blackness is a socially constructed identity, you know, or Asianness is a socially constructed identity. I mean, but it's not identities that we're fighting, we're fighting the body of ideas. And so anybody can be a white supremacist. You don't have to be white to be a white supremacist to subscribe to those ideas of white supremacy the same way that Clarence Thomas performs on the Supreme Court, for example. Nor are all white people white supremacists unless they subscribe to the ideas of white supremacy. And so people get a lot of confusion and they get somewhat paralyzed when they conflate owning a white identity with owning the ideology of white supremacy. But those of us in the human rights movement, we're fighting ideas and not identities. And these identities, uh, and these, I'm sorry, these, these competing ideals give us competing definitions of freedom, as a matter of fact, because right now in our society, we have a white supremacist idea of freedom that's very individualistic, that there should be no constraints or restrictions on anybody's actions, like forcing people to wear a mask, for example, which is you know, one of the craziest things in the world to object to a basic public health measure that could not only save the lives of people in, around you, but save your own life. And then another part of that white supremacist definition of freedom is civic freedom, where you have ideas around democracy that privilege some people over all others, as if you know, no one can mistakenly, uh, well, let's think about January 6th, the insurrection last year, where people mobbed the US Capitol, mainly white people mobbed the US Capitol, 
not because white votes weren't counted, but because black votes were counted and they didn't like the outcome of that vote counting so that they would rather deconstruct democracy rather than share it. So they have a particular ideal of civic freedom based on a certain set of ideas about who should actually belong to our society as holders of vote and voting rights. And then there's a particular practice of sovereign freedom where having power over other people and the exclusive use to use that violence against other people is promoted, which is why you know, many of us criticize the misuse of stand your ground laws that are only available to certain people in our society and anybody else, whether they're defending their life or not, may be seen as the perpetrator and, and be de-victimized even if they're trying to defend themselves because they're not considered including or deserving of freedom. In contrast, former President Franklin Roosevelt talked about a different sets of freedoms that we should be promoting within the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And we should be promoting freedom from fear, freedom from want, like freedom from going hungry, freedom from lacking health care, promoting freedom of speech, and promoting freedom of religion. And when you promote this definition of freedom, you understand that everyone has the same human rights, but we all need something different to protect them. The same way you'd understand that every child has a human right to an education, but a blind child might need her books in Braille. And so one of the things that's driving the calling out culture is what we call identity reductionism, where you believe that a person's political opinion or action is always correct or incorrect based on their identity. And to believe this, you have to ignore the evidence that their opinions or their perspectives may actually be harmful simply because of who they are, whether they're a white person, a person of color, a migrant, queer, et cetera. And then you internalize this identity reductionism when you are hesitant to express your opinion or, opinion or position for fear that you're not something enough, that you're not white enough, you're not black enough, you're not immigrant enough, indigenous enough, you know, whatever, you know, not enough. And then this is drawn by a desire to simplify very complex scenarios or conflicts simply to the identities of the people involved, where you actually are using an angel devil theory of, uh, of trying to explain the world so that certain people with certain identities are always devils and certain people with other identities are always angels. So you're denying nuances or complexities or even an acknowledgement of power relations. And we call this identity determinism. So when you're, Calling, considering calling people in or out, it's first important to be grounded in an understanding of power, systems of oppression, and how systems of domination work. Like I said earlier, the victimized violator role. And even as we have been through stuff and our life experiences can shape our responses, you also have to recognize that what you've been through is not prep school, you still got to do some learning. You still got to acknowledge that there are other truths that are available uh, that need to be considered so that our truth is not the only truth that matters. And yet we live in a context of white supremacy that really encourages towards very overly simplified and scripted and checklisted lives. As if, you know, you have this identity, you have this privilege, you're either good or you're bad or you know, gay or straight or whatever, you know, just trying to reduce complexities to their simplest forms we like to, to assume we can manage better. And it's really important when you're considering calling somebody in or out to focus on the conflict of, at hand and what is required to be resolved to keep people in the conversation. Because when you're choosing to call people out, you're choosing whether or not you're inviting them to a fight or a conflict. But when you choose to call people in, 
you're inviting them into a conversation. So for example, if somebody says something to you that you don't agree with, it's very easy to simply say, that's an interesting position. I don't know if I fully understand what you mean by that. Why don't you tell me more, which is a calling in response. Or you can do a calling out response and say, I can't believe you said that. Don't you know any better? We don't use that word anymore. We don't do this anymore. Well, in that way, you've just invited them into a fight because you publicly embarrassed, humiliated, and shamed them. And what this requires is for us to focus on our shared forward-looking vision for how we can build this human rights movement and how what is required to achieve it. And so Margot Okazawa Ray, who was a founder of the Kumbahi River Collective, writes that we work our identities out on the way towards a shared vision, shared vision, not the other way around. And another way that I put this in my mind is that it's through the process of struggling with people over how we build a just world that we find out who we're working with. I don't know based on your identity markers who you are until we've been in the crucible of struggle together. And so no, no grounded facilitator rules that tell me, uh, you know, tell me something that's interesting about you that's not on your resume really reveals who you are unless we go through struggle together. So I have a tendency to say that trust is developed through shared work, not through shared identities together. And so our whole calling out culture becomes very toxic because it replicates the carceral system of punishment, that same prison industrial complex we say we don't like. It discourages people, it frightens people to sit on their truth. They don't wanna speak up for fear that they're gonna be the targets next. And this ends up driving people away from the movement as people weaponize their privilege and their language and, and really try to dominate people because they think they know it all. And paradoxically, it makes accountability very difficult. Because why would someone even admit that they made a mistake or have done harm to somebody if they're going to be jumped at on, you know, jumped on for admitting the truth? And in this way, it increases the harm rather than create possibilities for restorative or transformative justice so that some healing can take place. It also devalues people's lived experiences. Like if you think somebody has done something wrong, you can simply stop and ask, you know, when you said this thing, uh, I'm not sure if you meant it to land that way. Why don't you tell me what was going on with you when you said that thing? And do you still think that now or do you think that you might be thinking something differently about that in the future? You can always ask people questions instead of rush to judgment about them. And then of course, calling out can be toxic because it isolates people rather than brings them together. And it also makes people very cynical and hopeless feeling that nothing can change, nothing can improve. Why should I bother to get involved? Because we're always gonna do all this messed up stuff with each other. And then there's an exaggeration to the call out culture, it spirals out of control. So if somebody says something that uh, somebody thought was racist, for example, you know, somebody will point out, oh, that was racist, blah, blah, blah. And then quickly it goes from somebody says something was racist to somebody actually is a racist because through, exact, through abstraction and essentialism, it goes from defining a statement to defining somebody's character. And then once that assignment of, of racism in that false binary takes place of good, bad, you know, right, wrong kind of stuff, then this whole culture of unforgettability and unforgivability is attached to it. Because if the person who's accused of racism or sexism or transphobia or whatever, if the person accused tries to make an apology, then they're accused of trying to game the system. So their apology, apology will never be accepted. But if they try to 
say, well, I didn't do anything wrong. I didn't say anything that was racist, sexist, or homophobic. Well, if they tried to, to claim you know, innocence or say my intent was not that, then they're accused of trying to evade accountability. So they're damned if they do and they damned if they don't in a call out culture that is so toxic and that generally spirals out of control and it becomes very, very viral. So I am going to stop the share uh, and uh, close this presentation so that we have time for Q&A over what I've offered. And thank y'all for listening to me. And hopefully we have a lively conversation. Thank you again. Thank you so much for that. <clears throat> um, hello, my name is Simone. Sorry, I forgot my camera's over. Hi, my name is Simone Dixon. My pronouns are she, hers. And I am the project director for sexual violence prevention response initiatives here on campus in response to a grant we got. Um, two-time woman gender studies uh, degree holder, and then I will pass it over to my co-facilitator. Hi, everybody. My name is Sarah. I'm a psychology major with a minor in women and gender studies. I volunteered for this, and I'm very happy to hear what um, Ms. Ross had to say, and I will be taking your questions along with Simon. All right. We did have one question come through in particular. We would like to know what led you to do this work um, and really hone in on helping people navigate um, people, whether it's calling in, calling on, and steering clear away from calling out. Well, there's an immediate proximity to how I got to it, and then there's a conceptual one. The proximate answer is that I have a 25-year-old grandson. And 10 or 12 years ago, it seemed like this kid couldn't answer his cell phone because every time I called him, it went straight to voicemail. I'm like, wait a moment. Every kid knows how to answer the phone. What's going on here? Well, he said, well, grandma, I don't answer my phone anymore. If you want to talk to me, you need to get on Facebook. I said, okay, I'll get on Facebook. Well, of course I got on Facebook and he migrated off claiming it now was for old fogies. So the minute I got on it, he got off and went to Snapchat or somewhere else. Well, I didn't follow him, but that's when I noticed how unbelievably mean people were to each other over social media, because I hadn't really paid any attention to it until I started you know, doing Facebook and Instagram and all that other stuff. And so I asked young people, what was going on? Because I didn't understand how people took license to say stuff online that I know damn well they would not have said to somebody's face. I knew that for a fact. People aren't that brave, right? <laughs> and so when I asked a young person what was going on, she said, oh, you mean the call-out culture? And I said, yeah. Y'all have named it? And she said, yeah. I, I said, well, what are y'all doing about it? And she shrugged her shoulders and walked away like there was something inevitable about the call-out culture, unavoidable about it. And I began to question that assumption because in my 50 year of social justice activism, I'm a rape and incest survivor who has you know, taught black feminist theory to incarcerated black men who raped and murdered black women like me. You know, and I learned how to have conversations with them, even though I wouldn't want to invite any of them over for a beer. <laughs> you know, I've deprogrammed white supremacists, people who are in the Ku Klux Klan or the Aryan nations. Again, people I wouldn't want to have over for dinner, but that doesn't mean I can't have conversations with them. <coughs> and obviously, <coughs> as a Black woman in the women's movement, I've had to have a lot of conversation with problematic white women because we're all in the same movement, the same feminist movement. And so I thought that my years of having difficult conversations with problematic allies and maybe so, even some problematic people who weren't allies 
could lend themselves to this conversation about how do we build containers to have conversations with people that we need so that we can defeat the forces of fascism, white supremacy, and injustice. And so that's when about six or seven years ago, I started doing work on this, offering trainings on it. Um, and now I'm in the process of finalizing a book on entitled Calling in the Calling Out Culture that Simon & Schuster will be publishing this year. Uh, teaching technique, teaching how do you call people in? Like, how do you react if somebody calls you out? You know, because that's something that people don't actually know. We're, we're afraid of being called out, most of it. And really, when someone calls you out, all you have to say is, thank you for giving me your time and attention. And I'm going to consider what you said about me or you said to me. And by the way, what's going on with you that would make you choose to come at me so aggressively? Because I care about you like I care about myself too. You see how you can redirect a whole call out into a call in? Because you don't have to accept that somebody's, you know, giving you all this negative feedback. You get to conscious, you need to, you get to consider that in your own time and space. Because the, how you react to it is a statement of who you are, not a statement of who they are. Thank you so much for that. Um... Lovely answer. Um, Karen asks, will your slides be available after this event? Uh, not the slides, but this recording will be. I can't okay. give away the slides. My intellectual property lawyer won't let me do that. But uh, I did give the university permission to record and share it. Yeah, this will be posted on YouTube. We'll provide a link later. I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. um, so you discuss how through either calling out or, you know, calling in, et cetera, that it takes different it takes a toll on us, whether that's forcing us to recognize someone's humanity, forcing us to take a step, I shouldn't say forcing, reminding ourselves to take a step back um, to acknowledge what's happening. How do you practice, I guess, care for yourself in doing work? Because oftentimes, if you're in a specific line of work or a certain area, you are the only one um, or you're expected to be the one to do that work. How do you care for yourself in doing this work? Well, let's keep in mind that calling people in or out is not obligatory. Your first priority should be self-care. Take care of you first. Because even if you don't think that's right, you need to do it. Because if you're still bleeding from you know, emotional stab wounds, even if you try to call people in or out, all you're going to do is bleed all over them anyway because <laughs> you didn't take care of yourself first. And so it's really important that the very first step of calling in or out is self-assessment to make sure that you're in a healed enough space to build that container, to have conversations with people who are, you know, who can possibly wound you, who can possibly further the harm. But it's also important to see to your healing because life requires us to have conversations with people who can harm us. I mean, think about it. The person who can most hurt my feelings the quickest was my own mama. <laughs> you know? And if I you know, decided that I was never going to have a conversation with my mother because of her ability to hurt me, guess how I would have orphaned myself. So you can't cut people out of your life based on their power to hurt you. You know, but you have to do to your do see to your own healing so that you can handle those difficult conversations with those people. Because I that was part of my adulting lesson, learning how to change my reaction to my mother rather than expecting that my mother was going to change. <laughs> you know, which was a very important growth lesson for me. But that also applies to the larger scenario. Like a rape survivor has no obligation to call in 
someone who's a rapist or even tells a sexist joke because they may be still healing from the wounds of what happened to them. But that doesn't mean that other people around that person can't play different roles, either you know, to help that person heal or to witness what take, took place or to be the fact finder or, or to be the bystander. Even a bystander is a role that can be played. I mean, when I offer these calling in trainings, I go through all of that. Talk about those five dollar lessons we we talked about that we offer online kind of thing, but there's many roles that you can play. But the number one thing to do is to take care of yourself first, because you really matter, and you can't even do it effectively if you don't take care of yourself first. It's the same way that you can't be a successful parent by neglecting to take care of yourself because then you're just gonna pass on your dysfunction to the people you're trying to raise. And so we really, really, they start with self-acceptance, self, self, self um, assessment, but self-acceptance is also part of it because you have to have learn to practice self-forgiveness in order to forgive others. And for example, the way we're parented often teaches us something about how to handle mistakes. Because when you were a child and you made a mistake and you were severely punished for making that mistake, then you think it's normal to severely punish others for making a mistake. You've learned the lack of forgiveness. You've learned the lack of second chances. But if when you were a child and you made a mistake and you were taught what you could learn from that mistake and you were taught forgiveness for that mistake, then you're gonna be predisposed to forgive and accept others and their possibility of making mistakes. So quite often our judgmentalism and our intolerance are taught to us as children as the only way to be. And, but when you're learning calling in techniques, one of the things you get to choose is whether or not you're gonna live out the patterns of your childhood or are you going to make different choices? There's no rule that says you have to continue to do the patterns of your childhood. That's a choice you get to make once you're made aware of those patterns and you get to choose whether you're going to act out. That also falls in line with what's happened to you. As I said earlier, I've been a, a rape and an incest survivor, but I chose at age 14 that I was not going to be defined by what happened to me because if I allowed that to happen, then my abuser would define who Loretta Ross is. And I refused to give him that power. You know, and so my lifelong struggle has been around self-determination. I'm Loretta Ross who's been through a lot of stuff, but I'm not defined by what I went through. I define who I am and the choices I make. And I like to think that what I went through made me better able to define how to be self-determining. A word, thank you so much. <laughs> I wanted to ask you um, as well, wasn't it hard to, you know, take the first steps in order to do all of this? Like, you know, I, um, I really respect and admire this courage and this bravery that you have um, hearing you talk about your accomplishments, uh, accomplishments and your um, emphasis on changing yourself rather than changing other people because you can't do that. Um, you know, what, what, what was the first step for you? You know, when did you, you know, realize like, okay, I want to get into this and how exactly did you reach that point? Um, well, first of all, let me just say it's a constant process. I'm, I am the call out queen. My first default is to call somebody an MF. That is my default, okay? So I'm constantly calling myself in before I call somebody else out. So I'm not trying to say that I'm that peace-loving person that just you know, sings kumbaya, hell to the now. I am the girl that jumps down your throat with both feet immediately. So I have to call myself back all the time. So... I hope I'm not portraying this as if I'm just, you know, the peaceful person out here. I am just a girl trying to figure out how I want to be doing better 
instead of constantly reacting to those patterns of hurt and blame and judgment from my childhood. It's a constant struggle, number one. Number two, I find that I don't like littering my own life with regrets. And when I've called people out, it's always blown back on me. Instead of solving the situation, it often makes the situation worse. And so I don't like littering my life with woulda, coulda, shoulda moments. I should have done this. I could have done that. I would have done that. I don't like making decisions that I can't look in the eye without shame the next day. And so that's why I'm so devoted to calling myself in because if I don't call myself in, I end up with a lot of regrets, a lot of woulda, coulda, shoulda moments. And they are not pretty to look at the next day for me. And so for example, I'm one of the uh, 12 women that created the theory of reproductive justice. I've written three books on it, co-written three books on it. And so, but back, you know, when it first came out, a young woman I was working with falsely claimed to the funding community that she had created the theory of reproductive justice. And here I am, a Black woman, so used to intellectual theft that I just overreacted to this child, just, you know, publicly shamed her, you know, basically saying, why in the world would you claim that when it ain't true? I remember teaching you this theory and now you're gonna just wipe us out and pretend you did it. And a couple of things happened because of that. First of all, because I was 40 years older than her, everybody defined me as her bully because she cried better over the internet than I did. So all people saw was me putting on her um, blast. They didn't see me doing it out of self-defense. So I created a bad narrative about myself because I overreacted to it. But the other thing that I did wrong was that I lost sight of her. She was a young kid. Why didn't I stop and ask her what was going on with her that she felt it necessary to steal a gift? You know, we gifted this to the world. Why would you feel the need to steal it? What's going on with you? As an elder, I should have seen her more clearly instead of reacting out of my own hurt. And so that was a call out I have regretted making forever because I lost sight of, sight of her, but mainly I led with my pain instead of my wisdom. And I don't like doing that. The wise words as always. I love, you know, you're, you've only been talking to us for about an hour, but I feel like you've shifted so many gears inside my head. I, um, I can't wait. <laughs> I um I really can't wait to take your advice and um I've always uh call out culture was always something that I've been wondering about you know sometimes I even wondered if it existed um mainly because of uh the you know punching up like you've said and punching down and all learning all those terms was really interesting but um you know I always thought how could we do better you know because the uh the goal isn't to attack like you've um said before but to teach right you know we don't want to we don't want more problems we don't want more enemies you know we want allies we want unity um and so it's important to try to reach for that first so thank you for for letting us all realize that today and um, showing us ways to really put that into action What I find in talking to a lot of young people is that they don't like <clears throat> who they become over social media. They'll do this quick posting and blah, blah, blah. But once they fall down those black holes of calling people out, all of a sudden they look up and they don't, they, they don't like themselves. They don't like who they've become. That's littering your life with regrets. You have choices over that. Hi again, Dr. Ross. I'm not supposed to be here, but I did want to ask you about something um, that I remember from the previous lecture that wasn't in this one. Um, I remember you, there was, this, there was a part where you were talking about how, I think it was like, we got the 
And right. we're too busy trying to convince the 90% or no, it was like, we should be working on the 75%. Can, can you talk about that a little bit? You know what I'm talking oh, about? Absolutely. Okay, yeah, I'm I fine. call it working your sphere of influence because we tend to misdirect our energy in ways that are not productive. I think that most of us who pay attention to social justice and human rights issues are what I call 90 percenters. And it's not how many people we are in the population, but it's how, what, a, what a high level of unity we have because we, we share a common language. We know what racism is or white supremacy or patriarchy or Islamophobia or anti-Semitism. We know what those words mean. And we have an in-group way of talking to each other with our own buzzwords. Our problem is that we spend too much time as 90 percenters trying to turn each other into 100 percenters, as if somehow we've decided that I can't work with someone who doesn't 100 percent align with me in everything that I think, which is so wrong because we're supposed to think different things. We're different people with different experiences. And so I see a lot of frustration among 90 percenters who want, who, who want that perfect political purity of opinion. Like, for example, I, I get in trouble because I don't unfailingly put up my gender pronouns when I put up something and then get into a whole lot of fights with people about whether I should or should not. And I'm like, wait a moment. Are you defining me as an enemy because I don't think precisely like you? I mean, what's going on here? And why do you feel the need to create more enemies than you can barely deal with. <laughs> What's going on with you? Now, outside of us 90 percenters are what I call the 75 percenters. These are people who largely share our values, but they come at them in a different way. So as a feminist, for example, like I am, I would consider the Girl Scouts my 75 percenters because they believe in women and girls empowerment even though they may not use the same kind of feminist language around heteropatriarchy that I use. As a matter of fact, they not only not, they not only choose not to use the words I would use, but they're actually repelled by the words I would use because they see them as an elite language trying to keep them out of the conversation kind of thing. And that's where we academics quite often get in trouble because we use these elite buzzwords of our closed ecosystem and then, you know, get offended if somebody says we're trying to dominate our people with our language, with our knowledge, weaponizing it. Outside of the 75 percenters of what I'd call the 50 percenters, they're my parents, uh, my, you know, conservative immigrant father who was uber patriotic, he joined the military, because he was from Jamaica, he always had three and four jobs and thought African-Americans were lazy. <laughs> he was kind of interesting that, that way. Member of the National Rifle Association and the American Legion, but definitely took care of his eight kids and his you know, wife and his community and his army buddies kind of thing. My mother was a conservative Southern evangelical Christian woman from Texas. And so they were far more socially conservative than I was, but I could always talk to my parents based on our shared values that they raised with me. Me with, for example, my mother would organize the church to always feed the homeless people, you know, feed the hungry people because she believed in community service and daddy believed in community service. So the way I bridged with my mom and dad, I would say, well, mom and dad, y'all feed the hungry. And as a human rights activist, I just ask why they're hungry in the first place. Can't you see that I'm living out your values in a different way? But I would never use my radical 90% language on my parents unless I want to be incomprehensible to them and, and, and make it sound like I was trying to lord my education over them. But I call them 50 percenters because they could easily go to the right or the left because my daddy's... Uh, army buddies could persuade him, you know, that we need to bomb every country that doesn't kowtow to us. Uh, the same way my mother was persuaded that birth control and abortion were sins by her preacher. And so 
you have to speak to 50 percenters through the lens of their values show them how you can uh, reciprocate and recognize and share the same values with them even if you work on those values in a different way and outside of the 50 percenters are the 25 percenters these are the people with whom you don't share a sufficient enough worldview coming from your 90% position to their 25, that y'all would even have a productive conversation with each other because, uh, you know, they're the ones who believe the election was stolen and, you know, Trump was the second coming of Christ kind of thing. So obviously you're not gonna have a real productive conversation with people like that because they're being manipulated largely with a lot of disinformation uh, by the zero percenters who are the openly avowed members of the white supremacist neo-fascist movement. And you're not gonna have any common ground with them. And so it's really important as 90 percenters that we don't try to overreach, that we don't try to flip zero and 25 percenters, which we often think we can do when we've neglected to consolidate within our power base, the 75 and the 50s, who are reachable by us if we can get over our arrogance and our weaponizing of our knowledge and language against them and the expectation that we have to pull them into the 90% circle in order to work with them. So I hope that summarizes what you'd ask me to do. Thank you so much. Um, we do have a question, um, and if it's too personal, feel free not to answer. Obviously, you do have that right. Um, but a um, attendee would like to know, do you have a spiritual foundation that helps guide your wisdom? I am influenced by a lot of spiritual foundations. I don't have any one. I love surfing all the spiritual traditions and sifting from them different things that work for me in my worldview. Uh, for example, uh, there's a saying from the Talmud in the Jewish tradition that says that my, my neighbor's material needs are my spiritual needs. And that saying, says so perfectly how I feel. In other words, I can't be right with God if I'm not right with my community. God will not accept me if I'm not right with my community first. You know, I like that much more than I like the selfish, I can be right with my God, damn the community approach to Christianity that I see a lot of people practice kind of thing. That selfishness way of looking at the world. Uh, from from uh, South African religions, I, I bring the philosophy of Mbutu. I am because we are. Uh, from Confucianism, I like the way we deal with ancestors and 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 trying to become a good ancestor. Uh, I frankly think that I take a lot of comfort in thinking that I don't have to be the entire chain of freedom because uh, the chain of freedom stretches back towards my ancestors and stretches forward to my descendants. And all I have to do is make sure that the chain of freedom doesn't break at my link. And so that's a very Confucian way of looking at the struggle that I'm in. You know, I like the Buddhist way of seeing growth and sharing of power. You know, the Buddhists say a lit candle loses nothing by lighting another. I love that way of looking at the redistribution of power. There is something that is shared and amplified rather than sacrificed. So all of those comprise my religious tradition. I can't say that I am any one thing. I am a believer in the collective wisdom of humanity. And I just sift from different traditions, those things that work for me. Thank you so much. Um... Lastly, um, to wrap us up, we did have a comment from Isabella Porve. I'm sorry if I did not pronounce your name correctly. It says, you're such an amazing speaker. Wishing I could turn my audio on. Thank you for changing my perspective and contributing and contributing your open-minded wisdom to the University of Michigan Dearborn and essentially the world. I was given a three-minute Sister Song YouTube video to watch as a part of my Women and Gender Studies class in 
at UMD, can I register for today just based off that three minute video? Your impact is contagious. Thank you for being you and being real, Isabella. Well, can I just encourage people to sign up for my mailing list at LorettaJRoss.com. And I'll tell you the next time we're doing our $5 classes because all of my classes are always $5. I teach white supremacy for $5. I teach calling in for $5. And like you say, the price of a chicken sandwich can give you new wisdom. Thank you so much. I'm going to turn it over to Sharia. Thank you so much, Dr. Ross. And thank you all for choosing to join us this afternoon. And thank you for those who were able to stay. We hope you found the content of this program helpful for your own personal journey towards realizing a racially equitable society. Again, this program has been recorded and we will be uploading to our website for the remainder of the semester. And we also just need you to do a quick evaluation for today's program. Feedback is always helpful to us. And again, please support Dr. Ross and the amazing work that she is doing. The link has been dropped. And also please check out our MLK Week of Events website to find more programming opportunities being presented by the University of Michigan Dearborn community. And with that, enjoy your evening and thank you all. All right, bye-bye y'all. <laughs>